Alicia, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Stephanie? I am really good. I am so looking forward to talking to you. We actually met uh, probably a couple of months ago, wasn't it, on a on a summit that I ran and uh, just having you on and learning about co-parenting, cooperative co-parenting and all the challenges that go with that. I was I was like, oh my God, I finally found a person who, who can speak on this and share and, and give us some, some insights and tips and things like that. So I am very excited to talk to you. I think everyone, um, all the parents listening, regardless of whether they are in a space of separation, divorce or not, I think this stuff is really, really, um, really, really powerful for relationships and just for humans um, as we are. So I want to say a huge thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure being on the summit and I'm glad to be back and to be speaking with you today. Yeah. Okay. So maybe uh, start us off with telling uh, everyone listening a little bit about you and your work and obviously your book, Cooperative Co-Parenting for Secure Kids. So give us a bit of a background if people don't know about you yet. Yeah. So I'm a therapist. I'm also a co-parenting coach and I'm also a mediator and a mom and a co-parent myself. So I have, you know, been through all the different stages of relationship and I work with people at these different stages of relationships. And um, so what got me to write this book, my book, Cooperative Co-Parenting for Secure Kids, was actually going through that really painful and difficult transition from being partnered to co-parenting with someone that I no longer wanted to engage with or talk with or see again, actually at that moment, you know? And so I had to figure out a way of how to be in a relationship with someone who I didn't want to be in. And that was really hard. You know, all my emotions were happening. I was super triggered. You know, at first our relationship was full of conflict and tension. And I could see that my daughter was struggling. She was in distress. I mean, I remember that day of walking into the, into my kitchen and she's sitting there and she's like, mom, I feel all alone in the woods. And I was like, oh gosh, I have to do something, you know, cause every parent doesn't want to see their kid in distress and struggling. And she was telling me in her you know, almost six-year-old way that she was having a really hard time. And so I realized I needed to do something. I couldn't count on my co-parent um, to make any changes. So I had to look towards myself. And, you know, I did research and I looked towards the internet and books. And I, I actually struggled to find resources on how to be in this kind of relationship. Because a co-parenting relationship is just as valid as a marriage or dating. But I found that there was just not a lot of information that felt helpful to me. There, There is a lot of information on what to do and what not to do, but the how to do it and how to be in relationship with someone um, who you're no longer romantically involved is, in with is very hard, you know? So I had to refocus on, you know, how do I just focus on parenting together? And, um, you know, so I decided to put on my therapist hat. I was like, I need to, you know, kind of figure this out on my own. And I started to apply principles from attachment theory science and other relationship um, strategies to my co-parenting relationship. And I realized it started to work. Uh, we soon moved from more conflict into cooperation and my daughter got back to being her, you know, happy and thriving, secure self. And that was my win for me. I was like, okay, this stuff works. And of course I started to apply it to my clients as well. And, you know, bring that lens in really helped me and help them shift the, the dance, the interaction. And so that's why I decided to write this book. So I was like, obviously, if I need this information, then I'm sure so many other people do as well. And, you know, I wanted to really change also the narrative that divorce doesn't have to necessarily, you know, be a big trauma for children. It's, it's a transition. It's hard. It's a change. But if we as parents do divorce well, it can be, you know, an opportunity in a way for kids to learn flexibility, to learn that change happens. Um, but it really is on the co-parents to take the time to understand their own stuff, their own triggers, their own, you know, ways of communicating and to shift that, you know, unhealthy dynamic so they don't harm their kids, but instead help them thrive in the two home family system. So, so my book hopefully, you know, provides that pathway for kids, you know, for parents to create that secure foundation that mm -hmm. kids need. Oh, brilliant. I love your story. And I, um, I know as you guys are all listening, 
please check out the links. I'm going to put them in obviously in the show notes so you can look at Arisha's work and find her book and get a copy. So all of that stuff, um, if you didn't catch the name, like we're going to put it down. It's Cooperative Co-Parenting for Secure Kids. But yeah, we'll put it in the show notes um, so you can all find it. So I, I love that you talked about we can't always rely on that other person. I, you know, I talk a lot about, you can't control anyone else as, Mm -hmm. as everyone else speaks about, but I'm a huge believer that we can't control anyone else except ourselves, no matter what that other person could be a parent or a child or an adult or someone at work, no matter what they say or do. And as, as um, mean spirited or hurtful as it can be, we are in control of how we respond and our, language, our communication, our behavior. And I love that you kind of touched on that, that you realized you couldn't, um, I think you said you couldn't focus or rely on him, couldn't look to him to change. So you shifted the focus back onto you. Mm -hmm. Um, and you also mentioned triggers and I know there are, I mean, there's, I have friends, I have family, I have multiple people, parents that I work with, um, in my coaching and they find it so hard not to get triggered by their ex basically. So are there, what are your thoughts around that? Um, I'm assuming that's something you experienced initially. You said there was conflict and that's something the families or the parents you work with. Are there some first steps or are there some tips or ideas? How do we not get so triggered when, like you said, we don't want to be in partnership with that person anymore, but we have to be able to communicate with them about our kids and decisions in school and things like that. Yeah. So first off, being triggered means that we are being emotionally activated from a present situation or a person or an interaction that's actually eliciting a past trauma or a wound from our recent past, might have been from that relationship or from our early childhood experiences. And Oftentimes, we're not aware that it's happening. It could be conscious or unconscious, but we're responding to the situation as if it were happening in the present moment, that past experience. And so the first thing is to really realize that when we are being triggered, our brain actually, you know, isn't fully on board. Our prefrontal cortex, the the front part of our brain is um, kind of like a computer, right? It's like what tells you, you know, it's, it, it goes offline and it's all static when we're triggered. And so we can't make decisions very well. Um, we can't, um, it's, it's hard for us to be collaborative and to take in other people's perspectives. We become very self-oriented because now we're in a state of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, which is focused on keeping ourselves safe. And so we can't even think about what our child needs or what's best for them. And so when we're entering into a conversation or uh, responding or reacting to something that our co-parent said in a triggered state, you're not going to do it in a way with a full brain. You're going to do it in a triggered state or a place of just survival. And so that's what we call that reactive state where you get more, maybe you might you know, yell or get angry or shut down or withdraw, or you might feel, you know, out of control or powerless. So maybe you resort to using mechanisms such as criticism or blame or gaslighting or, you know, you know, feeling really just kind of powerless so that you placate the other person. Those are all, you know, reactions from feeling out of control or feeling, you know, being in that emotional fight, flight, freeze state. And so the first thing to do is to really acknowledge that there has to be a mindset shift. You know, this person who you used to be your go-to person to meet your needs, to help you regulate, to co-regulate, is no longer that person for you anymore. And maybe they weren't very good at doing that anyway, and that their job is no longer to be your co-regulator, to help your needs of, you know, being validated or seen or acknowledged or, you know, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're no longer that person to meet, to meet your, those needs. You're that person now. So the first thing that you want to do is when you're feeling triggered is to pause and stop and to connect to yourself to separate out your need from your co-parent and reconnect those cables. I call them emotional cables in my book um, of seeking that, like, I need you to see me. I need you to validate me. You know, I need you to let me know that I'm worthy, worthy of love or, you know, good enough. And instead you plug that back into yourself 
and you acknowledge, okay, what am I feeling right now in my body? And that's the first step. And then be curious with yourself. What's my need? What's my feeling? What does my feeling need? Does this, is this present moment or does this actually go back in time of feeling very small and unseen or unlovable or, you know, wanting to be acknowledged by somebody that my parent didn't, you know, and so you can start bringing that internal self-awareness to yourself and then give that to you because those needs are valid, but it's no longer your co-parent to meet those needs. Um, I have a mantra actually that I use because my thing is I, I need to be acknowledged. Right. And so I would throw out these little criticisms or these little, you know, little things, which was part of what was creating the tension with my co-parent. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. I wasn't acknowledged in the relationship. I'm still not going to get acknowledged. So I created this mantra, um, that, that is, I'm not going to get roses from the hardware store. And that would immediately remind me to plug back into myself and to validate myself and to acknowledge myself and to no longer look towards my co-parent to, to get that need met from him. I still get triggered. I still get activated by the same thing. I notice it and immediately I do that and I can feel my system calming down as I move away from needing it from him and giving it to myself. Oh my goodness. I, I love that mantra. I'm not going to get roses from the hardware store. Yeah. That's like, a good one. Isn't that powerful? I'm not going to get that from him or from her or from that person. And so, so is it then that we shift our lens to, or the emotional cables? And I think you said, plug them back into ourselves. So find it within ourselves rather than, would you say, don't go looking for it in someone else, like a friend or someone to vent to, or your mom or someone. Does that make sense? I mean, I think our emotional cables, because our co-parent used to be the romantic partner are connected to them mainly, right? So when, in, in terms of attachment theory, really quick, you know, our, our primary caregivers were our, our, our initial um, uh, attachment figures. Mm -hmm. As adults, our partners become our attachment figures. What has to happen during a separation is that those cables that, you know, were connected to each other, those attachment cables, anytime we're in stress or have a need or need proximity or care or connection, they were wired to go to your partner, your romantic partner. A friend is not going to trigger you in the same way. You know, so you mean, so that, that's why, you know, what you have to do is unplug those to really create that separation. That's real separation. And when you're no longer triggered is when you know, you've done healing and you're no longer seeking any of those needs to be met from your co-parent. So yes, you can go to, I think it's helpful to have a friend or to have a therapist, I think, um, to vent to seeking sort of emotional processing and healing from a therapist or a coach, I'd say is, you know, really important to help you in understanding that, that, you know, how to help you help yourself. Um, venting is fun, but sometimes it can actually make those triggers even bigger because, you know, people love to sit in misery with each other and be like, oh yeah, I can't believe she said that. Or like, oh my God, I can't believe he's like, he's such an, blah, blah, blah. and we see it all over the internet. And it's, that's not helpful actually. That's creating more division and it's kind of watering, you know, pouring fuel on the fire. So you want to be careful, you know, like choose your people carefully, the people who are going to help you regulate, help you, you know, get back to yourself, help take care of you instead of fueling the fire of, you know, conflict with your co-parent. Mm, yeah. I really like that. Um, I think it's, it's a reminder for all of us to be careful what, what we're spreading, what we're, you know, communicating and, and to whom, um, so that we're supporting and lifting other people up and getting that for ourselves, not just, as you said, sitting in misery, which sometimes feels like good and validating, but really it's unhelpful. It's not productive in the long run. So, so I'd like that you mentioned that, um, what, what, when we're thinking about communicating with, cause we kind of just touched a bit on that with other people, but in terms of communicating with your, um, ex mm -hmm. when you have to, but you don't want to, maybe it's about the kids, like a decision for their schooling or a birthday party or, you know, that, um, I need to get your approval or we need to get permission or I need to let you know this is happening. 
how can parents do that with like in the best way possible? I want to say. Yeah. Um, So the first thing is to check in with yourself before you write that email or that text, make sure that you're not already triggered or already defensive or angry or expecting to have to defend yourself, right? That's going to come out in your tone and our tone and body language speak louder often than our words. And so that's why it's important, you know, to even do this, even if you're not responding or reacting to a text, just notice how you're doing even before you initiate a text or a request. Um, And so do some of that work before is bring yourself to calm, make sure that you are really phrasing everything and staying focused to, you know, the topic at hand, that's your kid. So the, 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 the protocol or the sort of the way to, to do this is to think about is one, you want to make sure that you're letting your co-parent know first before your child so that your child doesn't feel like they're holding a secret or information about a decision or a change in schedule or holiday planning before their other parent knows, because that's going to put them in an impossible position. That's not their role. And so, and also it makes the co-parent feel uh, powerless which means they're going to then go into a defensive position and may shut down. Mm -hmm. So you want to think about like, how can I, so letting your co-parent know first and then asking them, when's a good time to talk about, you know, school or vacation changes. This allows your co-parent to have time to think about it, to process this. And it's respectful. And it's kind of like you're setting up a meeting as if you're doing, you know, you're as if you're working in a business or a nonprofit. And you're using that kind of respectful, you know, cordial language is, you know, I'd like to, there's an upcoming, you know, art, we can use the school as an example, right? Kiddo Mm -hmm. is entering into kindergarten, you know, when is a good time for you to talk about school options? And then Mm -hmm. you send that off. Let me know by, I think asking your co-parent to let you know by a certain amount of time is again, asking to maintain boundaries, but also it means that you got to wait. Yeah. So some people are like, I need to know now. I need to know now. I need to make a decision right now. That's going to, you know, maybe off, you know, off put your, your co-parent and they're going to shut down or not want to respond or just be like, you know, back off, get overwhelmed. You don't want that either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when's a good time to talk? Let me know by X amount of time. And then the next email you send, once you have set up a time is to, you know, choose one topic and then look at it as kind of like agenda setting. And you say, okay, I'd like to talk about, you know, location, or is it going to be, you know, private school or public school? Um, And then there's a third thing, maybe not. Um, Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts. So you want to bring in curiosity and inclusion language so that they feel like their opinion matters. And that's going to decrease the, you know, feeling powerless for them that they're going to get defensive, or then it's going to increase this idea of my opinion matters and their, their sense of self is going to feel good. And they're going to more likely than not respond. Um, some people just don't respond at all. That's a whole nother category of just like, if I don't hear from you by a certain amount of time, I will take that as an agreement, um, or, you know, bringing in kind of agreements that you already have on your parenting plan, but that's sort of like more high conflict situations. Um, and again, you want to keep all of the dialogue really precise, give all the necessary details, the who, what, where, and when, and why, if you want the why in there, those are some, you know, kind of tidbits of ideas of, to get you started on, on how to initiate some of these requests, yeah. decision-making. Mm. That's really good. That's brilliant. I love, um, I love a lot of that. The first thing you said was check your, almost like your energy or your emotional state. Like, are you in that place where even just, I think sometimes thinking about that other person, we get, you know, riled up and things like that. So it's, I, I love that you, interoception came to my mind, that uh, the mm-hmm. ability that we have to check in with our own internal sensations inside our body and how we're feeling the rising or the bubbling or the, or the calm and the peacefulness. Like we are, it's, you know, it's a, again, a story for another time, but the, the way that we're not taught to do that, or we're taught to shove that down. I think this comes in really helpful here. So checking that, um, and the language that you, you know, you talked about, I think was an inclusive language and curiosity. Gosh, I think so much of that is missing and, 
I mean, you make a brilliant point that that has to come from us first. We can't force the other person to how they're going to respond. Right. They, you said they may not respond at all. So, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another key thing is, you know, sometimes in the more back and forth where it's not a big decision is to lead with an acknowledgement that also sends that sort of white flag. I come in peace because what we don't want to do is create the exact outcome that we don't want to have, which is a defensive response or a shutdown or a no, or, you know, and so we can sort of be more intentional in how we present and how we engage by leading with that acknowledgement. And that immediately kind of sets that tone of like, you know, openness and empathy even, right? Like, I get it. This is really hard or thanks so much for, or, you know, I appreciate it. Even if you're talking about like, let's say your co-parent never shows up on time or is sometimes doesn't show up for pickups on time. You can start with an acknowledgement for the one time that they did. <laughs> thanks so much for, you know, I appreciate that you, you know, came on, you know, came at four o'clock on Sunday to pick up kiddo. Um, can we come up with a situation that's more consistent because I find that maybe four o'clock isn't always working. What would work better for you? Maybe four 30, you know, and that's speaking to the fact that, you know, co-parents always like 20 minutes late without saying you're always late because mm. that's going to shut that person down. But instead it's again, leading with an acknowledgement and focusing on the kid's need, which is consistency as well as like, um, using curiosity and a question to help elicit more of a collaborative response. Mm, yeah, I love that. Um, so I, I had a question pop in my mind before we talk about transitions and things. I know mm -hmm. transition days can be so, so tough, so challenging and our kids can, you know, really struggle with that. But I had a question that popped into my mind about, um, because obviously you're working in this space all the time. I wonder if you have a story of a client or someone you've worked with, um, you know, some, some experience where you were able to see this sort of change and growth in a parent who maybe started out coming to you really stressed um, in that awful, um, you know, place of really maybe anger or, or grief. Um, but like, is there hope, you know, having, having, having stories where I think sometimes people do grow and evolve and move past oh, and yeah. can find the, I mean, you, you're an example yourself. I, um, I know, but does that make sense sort of to see a bit of a transition? Yeah. I mean, I can give you like this sliver that's coming up to my mind of these two co-parents. They were highly enmeshed in a way still they, you know, dad was still living in the garage and mom was in the house and they were constantly interacting with a lot of high conflict, you know, pointing fingers at each other. Um, they, and, through our conversations. And I mean, I worked with them a lot because we had to, I had to get them to separate from each other. Um, they were using a lot of anger um, as a way to stay connected, as a way to, you know, like working with her. So I worked with them together in, this, in the room together and they, they had been divorced already for over a year, um, but they were still in each other's lives like this. His fear of not seeing the kids or not being relevant or not, you know, getting approval was front and center. So he had to always kind of posture around like, yeah, but you and you, you know, doing a lot of the blame as, mm -hmm. a, as opposed to being able to be more self-accountable and to realize that he could move out and be on his own. And that would be okay that he wouldn't lose the kids. So that was his big fear that took a while to kind of come out. And her big thing about anger was she realized that she was using anger as a way to remind her that she didn't want to be with him anymore. So anytime she could, each time there was maybe a little bit of niceness or cordiality, that would actually send her into a place of like, now I got to stab or be a little bit snarky or whatever to remind myself that I actually don't want to be with him, which was interesting. And I find that actually a lot of people use anger as a way to not only just defend themselves, but to stay connected or to remind themselves that they, what they don't like about the person, you know? So once we could you know, kind of bring clarity to that. Then he started doing his own work. He went to, you know, he started realizing, cause she was like, you have to stop drinking. You have to stop doing all that. You, you, you. And it wasn't until he started realizing that some of his old patterns and needs came from early childhood, his own need for, you know, acknowledgement, all that. He then did his own work, uh, became sober for himself. And, you know, they took a little bit of a break around the holidays. And then I get an email saying, we have moved into two separate homes. 
can we meet up again for the next step? And um, there was still conflict, of course, you know, it wasn't that easy, but they had done the biggest thing that was so hard for them, which was to actually separate and create two homes and create a schedule that worked. And so then we started, you know, working together on like creating more consistency and getting the kid, you know, accustomed to the new home. And it was the next stage, you know, so that for me felt like a huge win for them because they were actually able to separate after yeah. so long of being enmeshed in this like halfway we're together, we're not together. We're definitely not together, but anyway, so yeah, that that's, that's a recent sort of success story that came to mind. Um, yeah. yeah. And it shows what's possible. Like, I, I think you said um, somewhere in there, the realization of what you had noticed in him and in her, like even that mind blowing to, to have someone from the outside in look and say, I think this yeah. is what is going on. And then for, I suppose each person to sit with that and go, Oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And she, you know, to, I just realized a part of the success story here is he is now more empowered in his own so being sober for himself. And she was like, I feel great. They came in, they both looked amazing and she's dating again. She's happy. She's like, I feel so full of life. And so, you know, it's, it's, and holding better boundaries with each other and being able to, you know, let him know this is making me feel anxious. And he's like, okay, yeah. I don't do that. I don't want to hurt you anymore. Right. Like it was just night and day in terms Whoa. of what they even physically looked like, yeah. um, taking care of themselves now for themselves, wow. not for each other. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. I just, I enjoy seeing what is possible. And sometimes I think we can't fathom the possibilities where you think, no, this is how it is. We're stuck like this. You can't see a way out. So, um, yeah. and, and I'm sure, do you have story, more stories in your book? Do you share stories? Oh, I have a lot of, yeah, there are stories, there are different scenarios that, you know, come from, you know, people yeah. that I've worked with or people that I know and oh, yeah. it's all, great, but all the great. names are changed. Everything is confidential. So, yeah. you know, you're not going to recognize anybody um, <laughs> from any of those. They're, yeah. they're not personal in that way. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's, maybe we have a few minutes left. Let's finish up with a probably, oh, it's a big, um, a big topic, a big challenge. How do we deal with the transitions Um with our kids coming back from the other parent's house, coming to ours. And we feel like there are meltdowns and they have these different behaviors because they've been there and maybe there are no boundaries there, or that maybe there are way too many that either that other parent is strict. I hear so many stories of, Oh my gosh, when my kids come back, it can take not, a, not, not only hours sometimes, but days for them to kind of find their groove back with the parent, with the, the parent I work with. So do you have, ooh, what, what do you, what can you share on that? Or what are some tips around um, dealing with that transition? I mean, of course, this is a big topic and it really depends on the situation and the age of the kid and what's mm. going on. It is easy to point fingers at the other parent, um, but there's a lot we can do in our own home. And one of the key things is connection and consistency. Um, so on those transition days, you want to make sure that you're not doing very much, that you spend a lot of time connecting, being present, engaging. You know, with my kids, she's very physical. So we would do a lot of roughhousing, which was exhausting. And as she got older, it was kind of hard because she's, you know, heavy and all that. But we would roughhouse on the on the bed and she would get out some of her anxiety or, you know, whatever she was feeling, laughing. And sometimes it would end in crying. So creating intentional moments of these kinds of engagement with your kids so they can get out their emotional, you know, whatever is happening for them emotionally. Because, you know, as we talked about at the summit, like anytime your kid is experience is exhibiting an emotion or um, an acting out, I'll put that in air quotes, behavior that we don't like, what that actually is saying is that they are struggling internally, that they're having a need or an emotion that may not be being met or seen, and that we, on our end, can create space for that so that they feel safe and secure and a sense of belonging and connection with you. And, you know, transitions are separations and reunions, and those can be hard even if you're living in a one home family system, you know, if they were at grandma's house and then they come home, you'll find kids, you know, often are still dysregulated and all that. So what we, what our job as parents is to not even focus on what's going on in the other parents' home, because that's focusing on them 
not on the kids. So get back to, you know, really connecting, engaging, playing with, getting on the floor, you know, drawing with your kid and helping them regulate their systems and get back into the consistency and the flow that you have with them that they can learn to expect. So even if your co-parent has different rules or is more lenient than you, you can, you know, acknowledge it. I know it's confusing. I know it's really hard. This is what we're doing here, you know, and help them kind of refine that uh, structure and those routines that they can count on in your home. Also, you know, I, I'm a big fan of ritual. Um, so th during those separations and, re and, and reunions, you know, create a ritual that's just between you and your kid. Um, so that they can rely on knowing that that's going to happen every time. And uh, so those are, those are the beginnings of some tips. There are still, there are a lot more, but really, you know, I think that we can do a lot with those connections and consistencies and, and hello, goodbyes rituals that can really help a kid out. Yeah. Oh, that's, that is beautiful. I like the idea of the ritual, um, something that we can do with our kids when they come back. That mm -hmm. is, would you say, plan that with your child? Like, what do you want to do yeah. when you come back? Because I know it can be tricky. Is there something, you know, do you want to go for ice cream or do you want to come home, do nothing? Do you want to watch a movie on the couch? Like, would you get them in on what do we want to do? I'd say have the same routine every time and have them. Yeah. And, but you can also see what they, what they want to do. Yeah. So have them, this, this can be a child-led experience is like, okay not even doing anything outside of the house is coming home down playing that like but not a big activity not a lot of friends if your kid is showing a lot of activity if they're fine then do what you got to do and that's fine too but if you find that your kid is is defiant or struggling on those days or having big emotions that's them telling you i need down regulation help me with that and so when you ask them questions they're not going to know but you might know what they like, like, let's draw a picture or, or you talk about it even before it happens. So come up with like a few different go-to things that, you know, they like that they have said they like doing like, what are, you know, you can ask them like, what do you like doing? What do you want to do? Should we, you know, and then have a go-to and then you just initiate it. Um, your kid often, sometimes, I mean, my kid just was like, can we go play in the bed and, you know, wrestle? And I was like, okay let's do it. You know, it took me a minute to realize what was happening. I was like, Oh, this is her telling me she needs to kind of like get physical with me and feel yeah. her in her own body, you know? And, um, and so it, even if she didn't initiate and I saw her being a little agitated, I'd be like, let's go, let's go wrestle a little, you know? So your kid, if you're attuned, will tell you mm -hmm. what they need and what they want. And, um, so I wouldn't ask them a lot of questions in the moment, but have it planned out that you're have things ready to go. Um, and I wouldn't do screen time because that's actually can frazzle the brain even more, but really mm -hmm. connected time face to face, you know, where you're really engaging without any other distractions. Mm. 10 yeah. minutes a day is all they need sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Such great ideas. Um, so would you say this is my last, I just have so many questions we could talk for so long. <laughs> yeah. Would you say then, um, yeah, limit, limit the screen times if possible so that you have that more connection face to face. What if a child, do you, have you had any examples where a parent says, my child comes home and they just want to close themselves in their room. They don't want to talk. And they've just kind of gone boom, powered down. Like what to do then? Should we force it? Should we go in? Should we offer to play or should we leave them? Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. Well, your kid might be an introvert. There's a wonderful book that I just got for my daughter who is an introvert who likes to go and play dress up now that she's a little older, it's moved from wrestle to dress up. And that's how she downregulates because at her dad's house, there is another child and there, you know, he's much more high energy, you know? And so here I find that she finds her calm again and by, by, and it's not isolating herself, you know, I check in, she's happy. That's her. And she comes out when she's ready and then she engages. And so I had to learn that like, by her, you know, there's no screen time though. It's her playing in her, with her, you know, playing dress up. And some kids like to read um, as a way to kind of find their own inner calm. Um, so I'd say, know your kid. Is your kid a little bit of an introvert? Do they recharge by being on their own? Being on your own is not being alone. You know, if they're slamming the door and I don't wanna be with you, that's angry. That is a dysregulated state and they're having an emotion that's the anger. And so then you want to work with them and let them know I'm here for you when you want to talk, you know, let them, if they are the kind of kid who wants to sort of self-regulate, 
you know, if they're pushing, depending on, how, I mean, again, this could be hours on who your kid is. And I think it, it really is worth getting to know who your kid is. I can't, you know, so th- th- I guess it really is about being attuned and letting your kid know that you're always available to them and that you're present with them is not the same as not as saying, well, I don't want to talk to you when you're ready to come out. You can talk, which is isolating and punishing. You don't want to do that. You let them know. I hear you. I'm here with you. I, you know, when you're ready to talk, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Oh, wow. I (laughs) have just absolutely enjoyed this conversation so much. I, I, as I said, we could talk um, for a lot longer. I could ask you so many questions and I know this is this is something that so many parents um, struggle with because it's it's difficult, it's triggering, it's mm-hmm. I don't know, is it not meant to be easy? These big um, physical and emotional separations. I I just um, yeah, I see a lot of parents who are f- trying to find some peace and um, and some calm in that separated space. Yeah. So just a huge thank you for what you're doing. Um, a huge thank you for putting together all your experience and your wisdom and your, your, um, your learning and everything you've done into the book, cooperative co-parenting for secure kids. So um, as I said, at the start, we're going to put all your links below for people to be able to reach out and find you and find the book. Um, Do you have any, if you could sort of share one message or if you wanted to something, just one thing to land with parents who are going through this now, would there be something that you wanted to just have them hear? Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that message of there's so much you can do on your own and in your own home and to take back your own power that to know, to, to, to not look to your co-parent to, you know, give you any of those, that sort of like, uh, feeling of empowerment, but you can do that for yourself and, um, and to really stay focused on creating those routines and that consistency and connection and security with your child. A child only needs one parent in order to be secure, be that parent. Mm. They will take that security with them into the world. They will feel confident and they will build a healthy self-esteem and healthy relationships. And they only need one parent to be able to do that. So you can be that parent. Oh, you know, I remember you saying that, I think on our summit interview, that it can, it can only take, or it can only be one parent. It can be only one parent and that can be you make that you. And I've said that to some parents since, since in the last yeah. few months, because it just landed with me. So for everyone listening, or if you're watching on YouTube, then just sit in that knowing and that truth of if it's only one parent, that is okay. And that that can be you. I think that's really profound. Thank you so much, Arisha. I've just, I've had an absolute ball uh, chatting with you you and I I love it every time. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I'm like, oh, we can talk for hours. This has been so fun. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much.